Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this exciting edition of our aquaculture webinar series. This series is brought to you by the United States Aquaculture Society and the National Aquaculture Association in cooperation with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System and it is designed to enhance aquaculture production and educational opportunities throughout the U.S. Today's webinar, entitled Aquatic Weed Control, will be presented by Dr. Rusty Wright. This topic resonates with many groups including aquaculturists, natural resource managers, and recreational pond owners. In the next 45 minutes, Rusty will walk us through his approach to controlling aquatic weeds, including prevention, identification, and control techniques. For those of you that don't have the webinar announcement in front of you, or may be watching the recorded version of this, please let me provide a brief introduction for Dr. Wright. Rusty grew up in western North Carolina. He attended the University of North Carolina at Asheville, where he earned a bachelor's degree in biology. Next, he completed a master's in zoology from NC State and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. After a postdoctoral stint at The Ohio State University, Rusty joined the Auburn University faculty in the School of Fisheries, Aquaculture, and Aquatic Sciences in 1997. Rusty is an associate professor, an extension specialist, and has conducted research and extension in nearly all types of aquatic systems from coastal waters to small streams and ponds. As an extension specialist, Rusty has a broad program but works heavily on pond management helping folks improve the quality of their pond experience. Thank you all for being with us today and with that we'll turn it over to you Rusty. Thanks everybody for being here. I hope uh, hope you find this informative. Uh, what I want to make clear before we even really get started here is that this is not a, um, uh, a, a what to spray, when, where, for every kind of weed. That, that's just not practical to do in this kind of time format. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to hopefully show you by the end of this is that, that, that it's a process. Weed control is a process. Uh, it's maybe not a technical integrated pest management approach, but that is, that is what it is. It's an integrated pest management. We're using a variety of different uh, 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 different approaches, all which hopefully complement one another and uh, help you keep the price down, if nothing else, and be very effective at, at weed control and also keep that uh, cost down in, in weed control. So that's that's my objective. Uh, Dave has already given you a broad uh, overview of what I do. Uh, I'm a 50% extension specialist, but I teach a couple of courses, uh, fisheries management uh, and uh, small impoundment management, pond management, and I have a 25% research appointment. Um, I, uh, my research interests heavily uh, involved in both in recreational fish, fishes, fisheries and small impoundment management, but a variety of other things as well. Uh, and so let's, let's think about what a weed is. You know, we, we talk about weed management and I think everybody thinks of that as just, uh, uh, well, any plant in water. Well, of course that's not, uh, aquatic weeds are not, are not that really. It's, it's really things that, where they are, where we don't want them to be. Uh, and I'm gonna focus, of course, today on plants, mostly higher plants, a little bit on algae at the end. Um, but uh, really, uh, uh, animals could be weed, weedy animals that we don't want as well. But, but we're gonna focus on plants today and how to control those. And so I like to point out that basically, uh, one person's beautiful flower is another person's noxious weed. And sometimes uh, that other person is just later on. Like you think you want that beautiful flower in your pond until it overtakes your pond or overtakes your system and then it becomes a weed. So we're gonna talk about that as well. So why should we control weeds uh, in, in systems? Well, first let's look at recreational ponds first and we'll talk about aquaculture ponds uh, or aqua systems. Uh, they, complete, uh, they compete for nutrients. We'd like for those nutrients that we put in ponds to move up the food web and, uh, and fuel our, our species that we want, like largemouth bass and bluegills. They interfere with our ability to use the pond for recreation. Uh, you, you can't really cast through, uh, uh, through these weed beds sometimes, and, and you just can't get out to fish because of the mats of weeds. They, they definitely can interfere with particularly bass feeding, but really all fishes at some point. Uh, they can cause oxygen depletions, which can cause fish kills. 
uh, and they may be or sometimes almost always become unsightly at some point, either uh, as they die back or just in their presence and can cause odors and other things. And remember, recreational ponds are as much for aesthetics as they are for fishing. Aquaculture. In aquaculture settings, they can cause that same oxygen depletion. If you have excess weeds in an in a aquaculture setting, and especially when those weeds would start to die, die back, you could have an oxygen depletion. They definitely reduce harvest efficiency. Imagine trying to drag a seine through a, a, a pond full of filamentous algae uh, and how difficult that could be. Or if you even draining a pond down, if there's a lot of plants present, it's not gonna drain effectively. And they reduce the feeding efficiency of the fish in those aquaculture settings as well. They can't get to those pellets if there's a lot of weeds uh, that are preventing them access. So it can cause waste in the, in the feeding process. So there's lots of reasons to control, that we control weeds. What are the basic control measures? And I numbered these intentionally because I think this is the way we should think about managing weeds. First off, prevention. That's the cheapest, best long-term control. Second, biological control. And by the way, by the way these, those two grade one into, into one another. I'll talk about that in a minute. Finally, kind of third on the list is herbicides. And, and when we deal with the public, we often get that question first. What's the chemical I can use? What pill can I drop in the pond that's gonna rid me of this, of this noxious weed? Well, if we set things up appropriately ahead of time, maybe we don't have to get to that point. So herbicides are, are number three. And then mechanical control really is a limited option only for a certain ki kinds of weeds that we really don't use that much. Okay, let's think about prevention. Well, the first element of prevention is don't bring them in. Uh, and I specifically picked this picture of a, uh, of a uh, fragrant water lily. It's actually a hybrid water lily. Beautiful plant, but when it takes over the entire pond, it's a real problem. So lots of folks like to bring plants into the pond. It, absolutely you can, but if you do understand that not only can you can that plant become a problem, but sometimes there are hitchhikers that come along with that plant that can, can also invade the pond. So best approach is don't bring them in. Well, obviously planting them is one way to bring them in. Uh, they often are the results of, uh, of uh, people cleaning things out of their ornamental fish ponds and aquaria, dumping out the weeds into their pond. Bad, bad idea. That's how many of our invasive species have been moved around the country and can certainly Im impact your, your, your individual pond or, or system or stream or wherever uh, uh, you're, you're at. So definitely don't do that. Uh, another way uh, is uh, through moving boats around from different systems or just anglers bringing things in from different systems uh, from pond to pond or system to system. Uh, and here you can see on this, uh, on the back end of this boat, and I copied these images from uh, the, the uh, Stop Hitchhikers, stopaquatichitchhikers.org, um, their site, um, uh, showing these, uh, in this case, it was hydrilla on the, on the back end of that boat. And you can imagine how, uh, of course, that's dramatic, uh, how much it, it, that would be easy to transmit from pond to pond in that s scenario. So how do, we, uh, how do we prevent that? Well, certainly you could just say, hey, we're not gonna allow any boats to go from one pond to the other, but sometimes that's not practical. So what we do recommend is that you definitely take a moment if you're moving a boat from one system to the other, that you clean the trailer, look the trailer over, make sure that you don't see anything, wash it off ideally. Uh, that includes motors, your fishing equipment as well could carry things. So a good quick rinse off of fishing equipment, especially things like waders. If, you're, if you happen to have been waiting in a pond, you can drag those things around in the, in the cleats of the boot. So be careful there. Uh, drain your live wells and coolers uh, between ponds and dry everything if you can for a few days thoroughly if possible. If you're moving from pond to pond, it's basically just be as careful as possible uh, with, that, with that system. And this applies not only to plants, but we, we have some invasive uh, other organisms that we don't wanna move around as well. So if you take this approach, it's a good idea, okay? Uh, you don't have to bleach, just good cleaning techniques and, and, and drying is ideal. Okay, 
Uh, so don't bring them in to be number one. Secondly, maintain the pond with deep edges. Uh, uh, no more the pond, no more than 20% of the pond should be less than two feet in depth. And that's because in that shallow waters where most of these rooted plants are going to grow. Now other plants may grow uh, if they're floating plants uh, in other systems or from other systems, but the, most of our problem weeds are rooted. And so uh, providing less than 20% of the pond edge uh, that's 20, less than 20%, uh, less than two feet in depth will not give a lot of area for these uh, plants to grow. Also, fencing out livestock or providing them only limited access to the pond uh, will help prevent erosion problems that can also uh, shallow out the area and cause problems. Typical slopes of pond edges range from about two to one slopes. That means for every foot, uh, for every two feet out from the pond, it drops by a foot, okay, or three to one, uh, or, or four to one, on, and, but, but really we recommend two to one or three to one slopes around the inside edge of the pond. Four to one is appropriate in some cases, uh, like on the face of the dam, we're gonna be doing a lot of mowing. But uh, two to one slopes are, are usually what we recommend. Three to one if it's a real gravelly soil that isn't gonna hold up very well. Okay, and so that provides that the water goes quickly down to below three feet in depth, and that's gonna limit light penetration, which limits how those weeds growing from the bottom of the pond. Okay, combine that deep edge with a good fertilization program can also shade out a lot of the weeds. Now, you, not every pond is gonna to need to be fertilized. That's a choice that the pond owner, we're talking about a recreational pond, is going to make. Typically, unless you're fertilizing for fry production or something like that, you're really not fertilizing aquaculture directly. It's indirectly through feeds. But, uh, but with, uh, with a recreational pond or recreational system, fertilization can be used to create enough of planktonic algae that will filter out the, uh, the light and prevent a lot of uh, uh, light from penetrating to the bottom of the pond. There are also commercial dyes that can be used as well understand that those have, their, have the limitations and usually are only used in ornamental ponds, uh, not so much in ponds that we wanna support a good pr productivity in like a fishing pond. Okay, how do we do that appropriate fertilization? Well, I can't go through everything, but just the, the main thing is to begin that fertilization early before the weeds have a chance to get started. So typically we recommend starting, a fertil starting the fertilization fertilization annually uh, when the water temperature hits about 60 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and then maintain a water clarity throughout the rest of the year between 18 and 24 inches. Remember we're trying to get we get the edges down quickly to three feet that's below that that secchi depth of clarity of 18 to 24. So there's very very little light that's penetrating all the way down to that three foot depth. Okay, so that's, that's the main thing with prevention, but another way of preventing weeds is to have a background level of biological control. And we have limited types of biological control that we can use in aquatic environments. And, and I'm gonna focus on the primary ones here. And the most, uh, the most common used one are, is grass carp. And grass carp can be extremely effective on uh, soft stem submerged weeds. Uh, less effective on more stiff things and certainly not effective on very, very small plants like water meal, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but grass carp, of course, are a non-native species. They're native to Asia uh, and have, were brought here in the early 1960s. Uh, they are still one of the top four aquaculture species in the world, but primarily for food. But we do use them here in the United States for, uh, for weed control. Okay. Uh, uh, keep in mind that grass carp, you see here, the, here's the business end of a grass carp. This is the, uh, the mouth and you see there's no teeth there. And that goes back to what I was saying about soft stem forms is what they can control. They have to be able to pull that vegetation into their mouth and then rip it free. Uh, they, they can't take bites out of leaves, for example. Uh, then once they get it down into their throat, they can grind that material up using their pharyngeal teeth. And their pharyngeal teeth are in the throat region of the, of the animal. And I just put that Asian uh, elephant tooth there. Of course, the different scales here of size. 
with that picture of that just to show you that it's a uh, you know it's got a design that grinding plate is basically the same uh, for uh, an elephant or, or a grass carp just different sizes but it grinds that material up so it has to be able to draw that vegetation into their throat so something stiff like a uh, a cattail would not be able to be able to draw, be drawn into the throat and so this animal would be pretty ineffective at controlling something like that okay uh, remember that grass carp are rivering species. They were native to the Amur River, uh, and therefore they are attracted to flow, and they will leave the pond upstream or downstream during high flow events. So we want to keep them in because it's expensive to restock, and we lose uh, weed control if they leave. So uh, uh, we recommend installing grass carp barriers. Here's a little drawing. We can provide you, or most extension uh, systems can provide you with this information if you need it, a more careful uh, drawing of, of this. This is a picture of a grass cart barrier across a, a, a spillway. Uh, so this is just a way to keep those grass carp in the pond during high flow events. One of the main reasons that we want to keep them in the pond, of course, as well, is they are a non-native species, and we don't want them out there causing problems in our, in our native waters. Uh, so, um, and they, and they, they are well established, unfortunately, in the uh, Mississippi drainage and the upper Missouri where they, where, they, where they do do quite a bit of damage. So what do we do, what do we recommend in, in terms of stocking? Stock, uh, for prevention uh, purposes, about five per acre up and uh, to prevent weed problems and then stock as many as 25 per acre, I've had to and even more to control uh, forms of, of plants or algaes that, that, that grass carp really don't like to eat, but they'll eat it kind of if they don't have any other things to eat. So you really overstock with, uh, with a lot of grass carp. Grass carp are not a permanent solution. Through time, you're going to have to restock uh, those animals because, as we say, they get large and lazy and, and, and uh, they have to, be, have to be restocked. So we recommend you keep an, basically keep an eye on the pond. You start to see weeds start to come back, it's probably time to, uh, to restock grass cart about every four to five years. Um, you need to stock at least an eight to 12 inch grass cart in a recreational fishing pond that has a bass in it. Otherwise you're just feeding the fish. Um, and by the way, I mentioned that these are fish that are raised for food. They're an excellent eating fare uh, as long as you uh, take them out of the time of the year when there isn't a lot of off flavors in the pond. So early in the spring, uh, coming out of winter, uh, they make uh, excellent fare for the, for the grill. Now, what about uh, sterile versus non-sterile grass carp? Um, we, uh, here in Alabama, uh, there are no restrictions on the use of non-sterile grass carp, regular diploid, genetic, uh, genetically diploid fish. In most states, uh, uh, it's required that, that uh, grass, carps, uh, grass carp that are stocked be sterile. Uh, and you're gonna have to check with your local uh, state agencies to see what's available to you. In some states, it's not legal to stock any grass carp at all. So you're gonna have to uh, work with your individual uh, uh, districts to see where, uh, what's, what's uh, uh, legal to, to stock. Some states require permits for stocking um, and others do not. Uh, do keep in mind that if you are limited to triploid grass carp, that they are somewhat less effective than diploids at controlling weeds. So we recommend stocking a few extra fish uh, than we would normally recommend for uh, diploids for, for control. Always check local agencies before buying grass carp. This is, we don't wanna cause problems uh, outside of the ponds or systems. Uh, and you certainly don't want somebody to have to come up to your pond and tell you you're gonna have to drain it and poison out all the fish because you've got non-sterile uh, grass carp in your pond. Okay, what's another uh, form of weed control? Well, tilapia, uh, the sick, uh, you know, uh, tropical cichlids, uh, are, uh, uh, can be used for certain types of weed, limited for certain kinds of weed control. Um, we found them to be somewhat effective for water meal uh, which is the world's smallest flowering plant, and somewhat for filamentous algae, although uh, with water, much more effective for water meal than filamentous algae. Generally stock uh, pretty high rates. They need to be stocked at 50 or more per acre, and stock adults, and stock non-sterile fish, so fertile fish, 
and um, and you need to make sure you work with your hatchery producer to make sure that you're getting a fertile mix of males and females because it's actually their offspring that do most of the control, not the, the adults you're stocking. Typically, unless you're in the uh, portions of the United States that are like right along the Gulf Coast or Florida or Texas, um, your uh, the, the tilapia will not overwinter, not survive overwinter. Uh, so they have to be restocked annually. Uh, and by the way, in those areas where they don't, where they will overwinter, those are some of the areas where it's not legal to stock them. So be careful with that. Uh, keep in mind that tilapia will not control a water meal problem with 100% uh, coverage or any weed problem with over 100% coverage and low dissolved oxygen. They're under stress under those conditions and won't reproduce. Again, just like with the grass carp, check with your local agency to make sure it's legal to use them for either weed control or for forage enhancement, uh, which we also do. So always check before using them. The last kind of uh, biological control is alligator weed flea beetle. Uh, it's the only insect that is routinely available, no, although not easily available, for, uh, for the control of uh, alligator weed or any uh, of our weeds in, in these systems. Um, this uh, uh, alligator weed is an invasive species uh, and uh, has no, um, well, has few uh, pests that are native to our, to our systems that would help control it. Um, so basically, this animal was brought from its native range to control alligator weed flea beetle. They are not commercially available. You can't go down to the store and buy a box of alligator weed flea beetles. You have to usually get them through uh, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, and they do make them available. They are extremely effective at removing the, the aerial parts, the, the parts above the water of alligator weeds. Um, so uh, you can get them. The only, the only downside is that they don't fully kill the plant usually. And so it, once the aerial parts are gone and they fly away, the alligator weed can come back, but it's going to reduce the amount of herbicides that you have to use by a huge amount. Okay, but so it is something to check into. So now let's talk about herbicides. So we got through prevention, got through biological control. What about herbicides? Because that's where everybody thinks, when you talk about weed control, that's where they go to right off the, right off the bat. It is really one of our last resorts to, to weed control because they're expensive. They, they, they can provide only short-term control, and of course they can be toxic. So we wanna be very careful. Check, uh, I can't, like I said, I can't go through each one of the herbicides. I can't give you all the restrictions for their use. So go to your local extension uh, system uh, websites or, or agents or specialists can get you publications that will provide you much, many more details on each of the herbicides and what's recommended. So with that caveat, what are the two main types of herbicides that we use? And by type, I mean how they, how they interact with the plant, okay? And the first type is a contact herbicide. And that means uh, that, they, that they kill only what they touch and uh, they're not translocated to the plant. They're usually very fast acting, um, but they can be short lived. And unfortunately, it's kind of like a chemical mowing. They, it, uh, it kills what they touch and then the plant can regrow. So you have to be careful to, if you choose to, to use these. Uh, I'm gonna to touch on a couple of these that we, that, we, uh, uh, that we do use. Copper compounds, I think I put copper sulfate on that last slide and I shouldn't have, because frankly, we don't really use copper sulfate uh, to any great extent anymore. What we use are chelated copper compounds for the most part, uh, because they're less toxic. But it's usually what we use to control algae. Uh, they can be included with other types of herbicides to make them more effective. Uh, be careful that the, these copper compounds can be toxic to fish, especially at low alkalinities. If you have alkalinities less than 20 parts per million, basically I'd be very careful using any copper or just use it for spot treatments. If you're trying, if you have a pond that has either trout or, uh, or poi, uh, uh, I would, uh, I'd be hesitant to use copper at all because uh, they're really sensitive to copper. Uh, they can be used in potable water, uh, so they're in many ways pretty safe to use, uh, and there's several brands out there. Diquat. Diquat, I probably recommend this herbicide probably more than any other herbicide. Uh, it's a very effective, non-selective, 
herbicide. Uh, it is contact. It does just kind of burn things back. But it's uh, very effective on submerged as well as non-submerged weeds uh, and, and can be used on some filamentous algae. It's not as hot, not as toxic as some other forms, and there's several brands of that out there as well. Reasonably priced uh, herbicide as well. Flumioxazin is a relatively new for, the, for use in aquatic systems uh, herbicide. The brand name, there's only one uh, uh, trade name available right now called Clipper. Uh, it's broad spectrum and it's effective on submerged floating and emergent weeds. Uh, it, 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 one of the best things is it may be something that we can use on water meal. It is something we can use on water meal. Uh, besides uh, only our most expensive, one of our most expensive herbicides, fluoridone. Uh, it does have some limitations. It does not effective at high pH. Uh, so uh, in systems that are really high uh, pH systems, this would not be your choice. Okay, the other type of herbicides, and like I said, there's a lot of other those contacts. I'm not gonna go through each one. The other types of herbicide that, that I recommend are systemic herbicides. And those are the ones that are translocated through the plant and kill the whole plant all the way back down in the root. If you've got a choice of using a systemic rather than a contact, use the systemic because it will usually kill the plant more, more completely and give you longer term control. Uh, the, uh, uh, and they don't usually cause the oxygen problems that you get with the, other, with the, with the contact herbicides because they're not, not as fast acting. Um, the first one uh, that I'm gonna point out is a, is a, is a really kind of a wonder drug in some ways. It's a very effective herbicide, but the problem is it is so expensive, fluoridone. Fluoridone kills most higher plants. It does it by interrupting the production of the, of the uh, carotenoids and basically the plant starves to death. Um, it uh, works well on fast growing plants where there's adequate sunlight. You have to have plenty of sunlight for this to work. Unfortunately, it's extremely expensive, and I'm, I'm thinking I probably underestimated the cost here. I know it's over $600 a quart, and it usually requires a quart and a half per acre uh, to control water meal, uh, and, uh, and that's usually the one we're recommending fluoridone for. So this can get very pricey very quick, uh, but it's a very effective herbicide. Okay, several different brand names. Sonar is the uh, original one. Uh, a vast a white cap, there's some others. 2,4-D, kind of the other end of the spectrum on cost, uh, is one of our oldest and best herbicides. It's a good selective herbicide, kills broadleaf weeds. It's a growth regulator herbicide, so it causes the plant to overgrow. Uh, it is, the liquid is inexpensive, granules or can be, can be expensive, uh, but this is one that we often use in combination with other herbicides very effective herbicide, still very good choice for many of our, our dicots, our broadleaf weeds. Triclopyr is kind of like, I kind of like to say that it's a uh, 2,4-D uh, uh, on steroids. It, it, uh, it, uh, it basically operates like 2,4-D. Uh, the only downside with, from triclopyr, two, two down, downsides, it's more expensive and it has a longer removal time, a longer time especially if you're going to use that water for uh, uh, irrigation purposes than, our, uh, than 2,4-D. And that's because it's, it's effective at very low concentrations. Um, so be careful with it, but it, it's very effective, especially on alligator weed and somewhat on water shield. Glyphosate, of course, is the active ingredient in Roundup. Everybody's seen all the advertisements. Uh, uh, it's a good non-selective systemic. It's translocated from the stems to the root, uh, so it cannot be used on submerged plants. It has to be only used on plants that stick above the surface where you can spray the leaves. Um, it is one of our least expensive herbicides. It is very effective. Uh, there are several brand, na uh, brand names. Uh, always check the labels to see what, what formulations can be used, but for example, Roundup, the typical Roundup you buy at the store Cannot, should not be used in uh, aquatic systems. But Roundup Custom, which has no surfactant in it, just the glyphosate can be. So be careful what you choose to use. Amazapyr is, an ex is a, a pretty expensive herbicide, but an extremely effective herbicide. One of the best that, that I've used. The downside is that it's non, well, 
both the good side and downside. It's non-selective. It kills pretty much everything. Uh, um, it's relatively expensive, but here's the downside. It's effective at very low concentrations, and so that means it's got a long removal time before you can use that water really for any other thing that might touch a plant. So be careful with the use of a mazepir, but it's an extremely effective herbicide. I'm not gonna, of course, go through all these restrictions, but I put this a little, these two tables up here uh, to point out that there are restrictions of use on all these herbicides. So again, get your publication from your local uh, extension source. They'll tell you how many days or what distance offset or whatever to, that you can use before using that water for other purposes. So, uh, and, and for those of you who are providing advice to other folks, if you're a consultant or what have you, make sure that you talk to them about what they're going to use that water for uh, before you recommend a particular herbicide. Uh, we made a mistake, uh, it was another colleague uh, some years ago, made a recommendation for the use of fluoridone, definitely appropriate to kill water milk, but the water was, they, the, they didn't ask what else they were using the water for. They were using it to irrigate uh, a uh, greenhouses and uh, basically almost wiped out several million dollars worth of bedding plants. So it was, it was not a good thing. So always make sure you find out what the water is going to be used for and make sure that those two things are compatible. Uh, for the most part, many of, our, many of our herbicides, none of our herbicides are restricted use pesticides, but some of them do have restrictions for cattle watering, which is the second, or livestock watering, which is the second most common use of water uh, here in Alabama, pond water. So, uh, so make sure that you know what the wa water is going to be used for before putting in an herbicide. And that brings us to the label, and I always have to put this in. Remember, for all chemicals used in, in ponds, the label is the law. If you violate the label, you're in violation of federal law. So follow those label instructions precisely. Never advise someone to go off label, uh, because basically you can be liable for the results of that. Uh, and usually the effective rates of, uh, printed on that label are the most effective rates for the, for the use. So follow the rates as well. Don't think that 2X more is gonna be more effective. That's probably not true. Uh, and then again, always ask that pond owner about all the other uses of the water before you make, make a recommendation if that's the business that you're in. Now, there are other additives that we add to herbicides to make them more effective. These are referred to as adjuvants. Um, a good non-ionic surfactant for herbicides that are going to be applied, especially to aerial parts of the leaves, uh, can help make sure that that herbicide sticks to the leaf and, and penetrates the leaf. So good non-ionic surfactants and thickening agents, sinkers or thickening agents, can be really effective at getting that herbicide down to where the plant lives. So that's another thing to consider as well. Now that brings us to method of application. Air, we have three different methods, aerial, volumetric, and spot treatment. Again, I can't go through a lot of detail here, but I'm gonna show you some examples of each and talk about some of the limitations. Of course, for any uh, of the delivery methods that we do, you wanna set up your sprayer or your granular treatment or whatever, usually with a small area to make sure that you're delivering the rate at which you think you're delivering. So that's my recommendation for uh, doing some testing. Test it with some, just some water, maybe the thickening agent or what have you, and make sure that it's delivering like you think it's going to. Uh, and uh, to do that, you're gonna need to estimate the area of, of, that you're treating. Uh, I recommend uh, some uh, standards, either standard survey measures or really online digital maps right now can get you there. We don't have to be super, super precise with these, and so these are, are, uh, are really useful. Here's just a screen capture from GeoMeasure, one of the mobile apps that I use to measure a pond. I can walk right up to the edge of the pond. Pond owner says, I've got a 10 acre lake here. I can check and see and find out it's really only five. <laughs> or or I can, uh, we can outline even a, where the weed beds are and determine what kind of area that, that we need to uh, uh, treat. Okay. So that's aerial. Uh, sort of gives us a total area of the pond, maybe the area we need to treat. What about subsurface applications? Well, you can inject these herbicides at depth uh, use, using a variety of methods. 
uh, weighted hoses. This was taken from the University of Florida's extension system. Uh, a good, uh, it's a good approach to injecting that material at depth. Um, or you can use, again, that sinker solution. Uh, another way to get uh, herbicides down at depth is to provide, uh, apply sinking granules. Uh, these can be put on with uh, this kind of a sprayer uh, type system, just a hand crank system. Uh, this is a, 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 the, the one on the, the right, I guess, as you're looking at it. The, the silver box there is, a, is one that is a big hopper that you attach to the back of a boat and blows the granules out. Uh, consumer grade, they make a, a, a attachment that you can attach to a leaf blower with a hopper that you can add your granules and blow it out across the surface area. So they, these, uh, we have all these different uh, approaches to getting those granules out, or you can sling them out by hand. Just be careful, make sure you use protect, protection devices to not touch the granules yourself. Now with surface applications, uh, I put a couple of examples here out of the spray coming out of the spray. It's a little hard to see here, but on the left uh, is really most surface applications. This is what we're looking for. And I hope you can see that that spray is kind of a bead curtain. That's what we're looking for. You, can, you may need to uh, open that up a little bit more, make it more of a, of a uh, stream for reaching out long distance to cover plants. Remember, you're trying to cover that surface of that plant with a surface application and cover it entirely and cover as much of the plant as possible. Here's what we don't want. Uh, this is uh, with it turned so wide open that we're getting mist, and that's gonna cause uh, drift that can also hurt both the, the applicator, it's gonna waste uh, herbicide, and it's gonna allow that herbicide to drift around, maybe kill non-target uh, plants. So definitely wanna get that bead curtain out there for application. What about mechanical control? Well, if you look real close, you'll see that that says TVA on the side of that, uh, of that mower. So this is not something we typically use in a small impoundment, uh, but, uh, but they do, do use large mower clipper devices. You might have seen the rakes that you throw out uh, to do it itself. Basically, you're in for a lot of work if, you, if you're going to try to mechanically control. And these actually can cause more problems than they solve. If you chop up the plant, those little bits and pieces of plant can go out and reestablish and actually spread the plant around. So typically, just not, not very effective. The one approach of mechanical control that, that does have its place, I think, is our barrier methods. And just like in your weed, just like in your planting beds, you can put these down, put down a woven, not a solid landscaping fabric. Those gases have to pass through this, cover it with pea gravel. Understand that this is not permanent. It will last usually for several years, but eventually plants will colonize on top of that barrier. So it will require some maintenance through time. But this is good around swimming areas, around piers, that kind of thing. Okay, that gets us to the plants themselves. Notice I haven't really shown you many plants, uh, but, uh, but uh, to, to do any kind of weed control, you have to first, number one, effectively, uh, to, to get a good uh, effect, identify the plant. So I'm going to show you a few of the different growth forms and plants, uh, the most problematic ones, the most common ones that I deal with on a routine basis. Uh, understand that uh, if I'm going to get that plant identified, I could bring the plant to the specialist and have them identify it. But now with digital imaging and good uh, uh, digital systems, two or three good photographs that really show all parts of the plant. And I'd say I can identify 75, 80% of the plants pretty easily, or at least get them to a level at which I know what, will, what control will work. So really digital imaging is, is really taking care of most of those identifications. If you do collect plants for identification, make sure you collect all parts, wrap that plant in a wet and a moist paper towel. You don't store them in water. Uh, put them in an unsealed plastic bag and then you can mail them or bring them to the, uh, to the specialist. Uh, if you seal that thing up and I have to open it, I will probably clear out this whole level of Swingle Hall because they, it's like opening a little odor bomb when I do that. So please don't do that. Okay, what are the growth forms? Well, they're marginal, emergent, floating leaf, floating in a submerged plants. I'll show you some examples of the most important ones here. First of all, marginal plants, plants that grow around the edge. Uh, water primrose is a good example. This is often confused with alligator weeds, which I'll show you in a minute. 
Uh, these can, there's several species of water primrose. Uh, they're all fairly straightforward to control with 2,4-D, triclopyr, or glyphosate. Here's red Ludwigia. This is another kind of, of water primrose. It tends to grow more in the water, uh, but again, you can, you can spray it or you can put down 2,4-D uh, or 2,4-D granules and that will take care of this plant if, if necessary. Generally, this one isn't a real big problem, but the other one, the yellow one is. Cattails. Cattails are a nice addition uh, as a, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a uh, focal plant. People like to have them, but they can also cause problems around the pond. They get so thick that, that it makes it hard to access the pond. You can control them by cutting and digging. That's one kind of mechanical control that does work, but you know, you got backhoe time involved in that. Uh, glyphosate is very effective or a combination of glyphosate. Uh, a mazapir will work well too, but that's a lot more expensive. Glyphosate combined with a little bit of diquat works, works extremely well on, the, on cattails. American lotus, very attractive plant, often put in ponds for their attractiveness, and then they can get out of hand. So that's the only problem with, uh, with lotus. Beautiful plant. Again, 2,4-D or glyphosate are effective controls. Alligator weed, we've talked about it a lot already. It grows around the edges of the pond. It's a non-native invasive plant. Um, here you can see one stem. The key characteristics are these uh, uh, clover-like uh, compound blossoms uh, that you see here on the plant. Note the, the way the plant grows is uh, a series of, of what we call viable nodes. Each node has a little stem coming off of leaves and note that there are roots coming off of each one of those. So if I come in there either with the wrong herbicide that kills between those nodes, or if I come in mechanically and start tearing that plant up, it will float away and start a new plant at each one of those nodes. So you have to be careful to kill this plant using a good systemic herbicide that will travel throughout the plant and kill the entire thing. Uh, one other key characteristic for uh, alligator weed to make sure that you've got alligator weed and not uh, water primrose is to break the plant. If it's got a hollow stem, it's probably uh, uh, alligator weed. Uh, alligator weed flea, flea beetle, 2,4-D triclopyr is my number one choice for this, uh, for the control of this in, in terms of chemicals. Okay, floating leaf plants. Uh, water lilies are a good example of floating leaf. There, we've got a couple of species here, and actually there's some lotus in here as well. Uh, but this is a uh, new far, uh, or also, also called cow lily. And of course, fragrant water lilies, which are again, moved in for ornamental purposes, but can get out of control. And believe me, if they cover the pond entirely like that, there's no oxygen underneath that, uh, underneath that mat of, uh, of fragrant water lily. So beautiful plant, but a problem. And, and again, there are hybrids out there as well. Uh, water lilies are, are, uh, can be controlled with 2,4-D or, or triclopyr granules or repeated applications of liquid glyphosate. Uh, and a good surfactant to get through that waxy leaf. So that's what we recommend. The granules can get a little pricey. That's the reason that, that maybe repeated applications of something inexpensive like glyphosate might be a better choice. This is another new, relatively new, for at least for Alabama, uh, it's been in South Carolina for a long time, the Crested Floating Heart, Nymphoides cristata. This is a real bear. This one's difficult to control, usually requires multiple treatments. It has a beautiful little leaf. That's why it was brought here as an ornamental and it's gotten out and it's covered large expanses of several uh, uh, South Carolina reservoirs. So you can see that's what a bed of, of an out of control bed of, uh, of crested floating heart can look like. And I guarantee there's not any oxygen underneath there. How do we control it? Uh, best we, I can tell, and this is still evolving on this plant, is uh, multiple applications of 2,4-D combined with glyphosate and a good surfactant, okay? So it usually combines and usually multiple applications to finally get it under control. A native plant that is difficult to control as well is water shield. It's also called dollar bonnet. Uh, and you can see here, it's got a little uh, oval shaped leaf. Uh, the, the, the stems that come up to that leaf are uh, covered with a mucilage and they have a red back to the leaf. This is something that grass carp can't do a very good job of controlling because of that slimy coating to the leaf. Uh, 2,4-D, triclopyr, clipper works very well on this. 
Uh, but do expect some regrowth. Remember, Clipper just mows it off, so we do have to be careful with that. Variable leaf potamogeton, fairly easy to control, but it is a common plant. Floating plants, water hyacinth is a good example. Um, floats on the surface, an invasive, beautiful plant. Uh, water meal, I wanted to get to this one. This is our, our uh, smallest flowering plant. And you can see here that people think they have algae, but it's actually a very, very small flowering plant and it produces seeds. Unfortunately, this tiny little plant produces a seed, which means that it's gonna come back up year after year uh, from, the, from the sediments. So how do we control that problematic water mill? It's probably one of the toughest plants that we have to control. Fluoridone is the, probably the best control that we have, but it is so expensive that we opt, off, opt for clipper uh, and then tilapia would be another biological control for, for, this, for this plant. This is what each one of those little specks on my hand here, that's my, my fat fingers, uh, is an is a individual plant. That tells you how small we're talking about. This is in the same group with, uh, with duckweeds, same family, uh, but it's very, very tiny with no roots. Grass carp are not gonna be able to control this because it's so uh, fine that it goes right through the gill, uh, the gill arches. One, another invasive that has uh, caused problems in Texas and, and some other areas, we, do ha we have had it here in Alabama, is giant salvinia. This is an aquatic fern um, and it has been found throughout the uh, southeast uh, in different places uh, and somewhat in, in some areas of California. This was an a ornamental that got out of control here as well. Uh, if you look at the leaves, you see a little basket shaped uh, hairs uh, at the, at, on the leaves, this is how you know it's giant salvinia. We have common salvinia as well, uh, but the giant salvinia is the tough one. If you think you've got giant salvinia, uh, you know, please contact uh, a biologist, other, other uh, biologists. Uh, they may actually have funding to help you get this under control. Okay, submerged plants, uh, uh, I save those for last year besides the algaes because in some ways they're our most problematic because you don't see them growing until they've caused you a lot of problems. Slender spike rush is both a submerged and an emergent plant. Uh, it's very thin, uh, the grass carp don't like it. It's very tough. They will eat it if they don't have, uh, they'll try to eat it if they don't have much else to eat. It's an extremely difficult plant to control. Uh, we usually end up using a contact herbicide like diquat and just repeatedly burning it off. Uh, Southern Naiad, fairly easy to control, but very common and can cause problems. Uh, and it's a submerged plant. And uh, uh, water milfoil is an invasive species. Grass carp will control this. There's some uh, uh, unfortunate information out there that, that says that it, it won't be controlled by grass carp. They absolutely can be controlled by grass carp. Anybody wants to call me and discuss that with me, I'll be happy to, to explain to you why that is. 2,4-D, diquat, and aquathol, all good choices for, for that. On the algae, uh, we often really don't can try to control planktonic algae because they, uh, uh, we can cause an oxygen depletion. But filamentous algae, we do control. And we usually require some type of copper compound. Do not apply any copper compound without testing for that alkalinity because that can cause a problem. Cara and muskrats are types of algae. Grass carp usually control those fairly effectively. The bad one is lingbia. Lingbia requires a mixture of copper, diquat, and a sinking solution, and or 25 or more grass carp per acre to get under control. This is a cyanobacteria. It's not actually an algae. It's a blue-green, and it has toxins, and it's just a bad, it's a bad critter to get under control. This is what it looks like. Uh, that's a green algae in the background on, and on the front of her hand there, that's what uh, lingbia looks like. Lingbia grows throughout the year. It's very tough to control uh, and it doesn't actually grow fast, but it grows consistently and it's, it's hard to get an uh, herbicide through that sheath that grows around the outside. Okay, so one of the biggest uh, weed control errors that I see, most common, Inconsistent fertilization. You don't start it early enough and you don't keep it up. And so the plants get out of control. Introducing weeds, bad problem. It comes in, people think they want a pretty weed or pretty plant, it becomes a terrible weed. Not having a background levels of grass carp to keep weeds under control. 
using copper without checking alkalinity and using the wrong herbicide because you haven't gotten the weed identified. And finally, probably the biggest problem is people wait till it's a big problem before controlling it. If you can control it when it's a small problem, it's a lot cheaper, a lot easier to control. So here's the take on prevention. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So that's what we want to go with first. Second would be biological controls where we can use that kind of in combination with prevention and maybe never have to use an herbicide. And finally, herbicides at and treat early before the plant takes over the pond. Get it identified, get a good choice for an herbicide and treat when it's a small problem. So with that, I'll wrap it up. And if anyone has any questions, happy to take those. Okay, uh, what rate? Typically, if you use a pond fertilizer, which is usually something like, let's say that's rated for ponds, something like 10, uh, 34, zero or 10, uh, um, uh, 38, zero, that would be like DAP. That would be a diammonium phosphate, uh, would be in those, in those areas, that liquid. Uh, we use about a gallon of concentrate per acre. Make sure that you dilute it with water, uh, and then put it out in the prop wash of a boat, or if it's a small pond, you can kind of slosh it out from the surface. Make sure you dilute it at least three parts of, of water to one part fertilizer. Otherwise, it'll go right to the bottom and cause you a lot of problems. So you can also use uh, the uh, powdered fertilizer that's designed for ponds. It's, uh, um, I, I couldn't give you the, 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 the breakdown right now. It's something like 10540 or, or 10544, something like that. As, uh, and um, it's a highly soluble fertilizer, doesn't require, uh, doesn't require that it be mixed with water. You can scatter it out across the surface at four to six pounds per acre uh, across the surface uh, and uh, just make sure it's not sinking to the bottom, make sure there are no lumps in it scattered it across the surface. Initially, in the first part of the year, I recommend going a little high on the fertilizer with your first application. Uh, maybe double the fertilization rate the first application. Then every 10 days to two, week, two weeks, use the regular rate and um, measure your water clarity to, to, till you get between 18 and 24 inches. Now you mentioned urea. Urea uh, has its role to play. If you can't get a bloom started in a pond, can't get that water green, with standard pond fertilizers, uh, then I recommend uh, coming in, and, and, and it's not because of too much flushing or other, or, or sharp cold events or anything else that might kill the bloom. Then you can use about 10 pounds of, uh, of urea per acre. You don't have to worry about it touching the bottom of the pond. With the fer phosphorus fertilizer, you don't want it to touch the bottom of the pond. With the urea, it's highly soluble. So you can just spread that around the edge and let it go into solution. And sometimes that will stimulate a bloom. It means that the pond was a little nitrogen limited. So that's what I recommend to that. So I don't recommend it as a standard fertilization, but only if you've got a problem getting it green. That's a good point. Uh, for example, Georgia requires that they be triploid uh, a sterile grass carp. South Carolina, every load of grass carp that goes into South Carolina is tested first to make sure there are no fertile grass carp in that load and they will escort you back to the border if they find a, a fertile grass carp in your, in your tank if you're bringing them into the state. So it is absolutely the case that we want to go with whatever your local uh, um, um, uh, agency recommends and, and what they uh, uh, say is legal. Same thing for, for tilapia as well. For hydrilla, grass carp are excellent choices. But again, if you're talking about insect controls, uh, I don't think any of those things are, are commercially available or even easily available. But yes, there are some weevils that have been investigated as well as some borers for certain of these species. Uh, I think for the, I'm trying to remember on the, uh, on the uh, water hyacinth, I believe that is a weevil that, is, uh, that does that. But again, I don't think, I don't know where I could send you to go get those is the thing. I, I can, I do know Corps of Engineers can get the uh, alligator weed feed beetle. The answer is yes, I, I didn't mention that. Koi are common carp. They're just colorful common carp. And common carp can be used in combination with grass carp, 
uh, to help control filamentous algae. Because what are they doing? They're ripping, uh, grass carp generally don't rip up the bottom too much. Uh, you know, we have people that are concerned that they ca might cause some erosion and other things in ponds. They generally don't, but common carp do. They'll root around in the bottom of the pond. Generally, we don't like that, but if we're trying to get rid of filamentous algae, having a few, maybe up to three to five per acre max, to tear up those uh, algae beds and get them loosened up and uh, make them uh, less productive uh, can, can make our, our other controls more effective, like grass carp. So they do have a role to play only in algae control. Oh, that's probably a good idea. Although, you know, I've never really seen an overabundant reproduction as long as there are bass present. Uh, it seems like the bass clean those little carp up. But uh, yeah, if you can get, get same-sex common carp, ideal. That's ideal. Thank you, Rusty, for that excellent presentation. And to all of you listening for sharing your time with us today. Just as a reminder, a recording of this and many other educational aquatic webinars are posted on the United States Aquaculture Society webpage at usaquaculture.org in the Continuing Education section, as well as the NAA webpage and the Alabama Cooperative Extension System webpage and YouTube channels. Thanks again for your time, and we hope to see you again soon.